I think hey, it did too. Hey, it worked. Hey, everybody. Ooh. Fraser Kane here, publisher, Universe Today, and this is your virtual star party for... Don't May. do it. Don't do it. <laughs> for, for May 4th. There you go. 2014. Uh, star Wars Day. Um... So we've got uh, we've got some uh, we've got some special guests here tonight. Uh, so let's see, let's kind of move through the crowd we've got here. We've got Andrew Dumbleton who is running the Eye Telescope. In, I'm friends. He's in England. It's in New Mexico. And I'm seeing uh, low res. Hmm. Okay, that'll clear up. Speaking of low res, we got David Dickinson. <laughs> hey, we got Andrew actually, Dickinson over here. Eight bit Dickinson. It, it, it actually says eight inch SCT Hudson, Florida. I'll just keep reading it till I someday solve whatever the problem is with this. I like to, you know, just change it to eight bit and we'll be good. Yeah, <laughs> David eight bit Dickinson. <laughs> Pretty much. Good, Gary Ganella. Hey, Gary. Hi, guys. How's it going, Gary? Um, oh, I don't know. We got, we got Stuart Foreman. Hi. Without a telescope. All right, clouds. That's all right. That's all right. And we got uh, my co-host Scott Lewis. Hey, Scott. How's it going? Also known as at Scientific Scott. Follow him on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. I tweet a lot. And Google Plus even harder. And we got a very special guest today. Uh, We got Hannah Khan from India. Hey, Hannah. Hi, everyone. From the future. From Hannah is from the future. (laughs) I am from the future, yes. <laughs> yeah, what's, what's it like tomorrow? It's bright and sunny here. In oh, the perfect. Future. So, whereabouts yeah, are you located, Hannah? Sorry? Where are you? I said India, I'm, but I, that's a big country. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Bombay. I'm You're in Bombay. Bombay. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> so, Hannah uh, has been sort of circling the uh, Astro community for quite a while now. She has sort of came under onto our radar for doing a bunch of really cool uh, educational outreach with uh, students in India and teaches them astronomy experiments and uh, makes rockets and things like that and has been uh, sort of participating with CosmoQuest and now is working on a project with uh, with Scott Lewis. Right. So before we get into the uh, the actual astronomizing, why don't we let you guys do a quick plug of what it is that you're doing? Go for it, Hannah. You're our special guest. They they hear me talk all the time. <laughs> yes, they do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we have uh, organized an event uh, for 9th of May, and it's called it's the One Sky event, where we are celebrating the fact that we all share one sky and one earth. And uh, it's 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 basically a sidewalk astronomy event done on an international scale, where astronomers from everywhere. Uh, we'll be just setting up telescopes everywhere and their local public places and you know anyone who's passing by can take a look at the moon, Jupiter, Mars, Saturn. Um, so yes, we have about 12 countries participating so far and that's just awesome. Uh, we are trying to open more people from different countries and uh, so uh, we hope that, that you know, this is going to turn out to be a nice big event. And uh, yeah, that's it. All right, well, that sounds great, but maybe can you put that in commercial form? <laughs> Scott can do that. We live in a world where there are countless borders built between us, both physically and socially. However, we have one sky that unites us all. Looking up into the night sky is something that we can all do, regardless of where we live on this planet. On the 9th of May, people from across the globe will be doing just that. Looking up and appreciating one of the things we all share, our sky. We will be joining astronomers from around the world who will be setting up telescopes absolutely free for anybody who wants to look through. You can join in as well by attending local events or virtually on Facebook, Google Plus, and Twitter. Looking through a telescope will let you see Mars and Saturn, star clusters too. But you don't even need a telescope as long as you have clear skies. We can all look up at the moon together. So on the 9th of May, join us in gazing up at the night sky. If you're hosting your own local star party, share with us the details on any of our event pages, which are linked in the description below. Don't forget to share your pictures or astrophotography with the world using the hashtag OneSky. Wherever you are in the world, let's look up at OneSky and share our sense of wonder about our cosmos.
Fantastic. That's going to be Thanks. great. So May 9th, um, Sidewalk Astronomy event. So, How can yeah, we get involved? We have an event over on uh, one of my other channels, over on Space Fan News. So find us on Google Plus at Space Fan News, uh, where we have our event set up there. Also, uh, Hannah has a Facebook event set up as well. That's uh, by it's on your name, but if you just go to knowthecosmos.com slash one sky, it has all the events, all the information you need. I'll put the link below in the event page, and uh, that just has everything. So as far as us getting more information as it's being updated, we'll be updating it there and throughout all of the other events that we have for it. All right, sounds great. Um, and Shaw has just joined us. Hey, Shaw. So Shaw is dealing with a lot of spyware at the moment, uh, <laughs> and so he's trying to clean his computer uh, at the same time, which it's funny just seeing him pop in and freeze for a bit. So uh, everyone can go and harass him at on Twitter at ShawGazer and <laughs> tell him which which computer cleaning software do you use, and just tweet it at Shaw and let him know. Now we got two Shaws. Perfect. All right. Well, I'm going to move on to the actual uh, space stuff here. While uh, while Shaw gets his uh, his spiral under control, it could be days. <laughs> so, David, what is this uh, glowing gray orb you're showing us? This is a very blobby, blurry version of the moon that's probably about five degrees above the western horizon. Getting set, the moon's like waxing crescent right now. I think about 25 percent illuminated. But it's kind of cool along the Terminator. You're seeing the sun rise there. The, the crater I had right at the top, you could see the central peak where the sun is just starting to hit it. I uh, looked that up. That's uh, Theophilus is the name of that crater right there. Yeah, the uh, the moon is really low on the horizon even for for me. And yeah, I'm... On the west coast, it should be... Uh, a little higher for yeah. folks out there right now. It's, yeah, it'll be yeah, setting though. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think wow. I was going to be able to get it at all. It's it's really close to the fence. Probably in a few minutes I'll move over to Mars. I'll mute myself and then uh, reconfigure everything over to Mars. Then we'll move on to Saturn. I'll be able to get that too. Mars won't be as blobby. And yeah. it's super close right now, so it's going to be the best view of Mars we're going to have for, for a couple of years. Yeah, Once for another 26 months. Yeah, oppositions come around. Mars was at opposition last month, and Saturn reaches opposition next weekend, as a matter of fact. So it's, they're both in very good viewing positions right now. Jupiter just went behind the fence, so I won't be able to get that. Jupiter is very close to the moon tonight. They're both in Gemini right now. So. Yeah, right here. So Wow, that must be really close to your, to your fence, because there's Jupiter right there, and there's the moon. <laughs> so you really are just squeezing yeah. the moon in there real quick. Yeah, when I looked earlier tonight, I, I didn't think when I looked at the rising setting times, I thought I didn't think I'd be able to get the moon, but about 20 minutes ago I, I looked and I was like, well, it's, it's high enough above the fence, I might as well start there. It's strange that we're going to lose Jupiter. You know, wouldn't be the virtual star party with, uh, without <laughs> Jupiter. But, um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm going to move to Andrew's view, and Andrew's got a bunch of, uh, bunch of stars. What's this, Andrew? Yeah, this is uh, M44, the Beehive Cluster. Um, so this, this is the central part of it. So you, you see, um, if I could spin it around, what looks like a little house. <laughs> I think it's also called the Precep or the uh, the Manger. I've got a little uh, a blooming on there, you can see, from uh, the stars being so bright in that telescope. So much light, I, yeah. I think it's just the, the bees are buzzing really yeah. strongly tonight. And... <laughs> You can really bees. see them fly. <laughs> That's great. All right, and Gary. Uh, M81 and M82. And um, you appear to be again. for the color, but I don't have color ballots running right now. Mm. Am I blinking? Yeah. Why so is sorry. It doing that again? I have no idea why it's doing that. I don't know. It, you it should talk to the person last week too. who programmed it. Yeah. Well, I'm currently building a whole new operating system disk, so this one's old. Oh, well, that'll help. Hopefully that's the problem. So now, Stuart, because you don't have skies tonight, you're going to work on a project here in the background? What's, what's Right, going on? so... Um, Macrame? Are you yeah. crocheting? Are you going to knit something? Uh, yeah, so what um, 
uh, what I'm doing is I'm creating, um, I'm going to be working on an image. I Hopefully I can get it done within the hour, but right now I'm creating flat masters. And uh, if, you, if you see my, my screen, you see vignetting on the left, and you see dust bunnies to the right. And this is kind of what astrophotography, astro uh, photographers have to deal with and the whole point of this particular image which just looks like a gray blob is to take out those in the final image and I'll, and I'll show that when I'm ready. So you're teaching the software what's bad about your Exactly. Image. That's exactly what I'm doing. And so okay. once this this is a master of all the light frames, I'm going to do the RGB in a second and then I'm going to load all the light frames and then um, uh, uh, and then subtract these out. Actually, you divide out the flat frames, but yeah. So, so real quick, how did you create that so, flat before you go to subtract it? Is it right, so... I like these dust bunnies here, let's remove them, or how do you do that? Right, well, what you do is you have to actually have a, a very... Um, even field and so I actually have a panel that I stick on top of my telescope and it's an illuminated panel and then I take um, an image of this panel of um, you know X amount of seconds just to get um, a certain amount of saturation of the chip um, and you just keep it in exactly the same optical configuration as you're taking the light frames and you do it the same night so theoretically the dust bunnies that are there when I took this flat frame are also going to be there when I when I take the light frames. Gotcha. Um, Gary, we got a request from our good friend Helen Reed for the Guitar Nebula in Cephas. Guitar Nebula? Yeah, in Cephas. Whoa. Never heard of it. I know, so it's worth going after. I'll look it up one sec. Apparently yeah. Brian Koberlein uh, wrote about it. Brian, yeah. always messing with our stuff. We had to get him in here. I will have to hound him. That'd be great. Okay. Or you should that, hound him. He writes for you. Guitar, G U I, like. Yeah, Guitar Nebula. Like the guitar, G U I T A. It's not coming yeah. up on my. Oh, I'm seeing something from Cornell. Let me pull something up. Uh, Helen, do you have an NGC number or something? I'm pulling one up here for you. Um, hold on. Let me to Gary's view. Um. Neutron star B two two four. Man, we need to. A... I'm trying to find a designation for it. Yeah, I'm having trouble too. Although, from what I'm also seeing here, two of these images that are playing up are from Hubble Space Telescope. So, uh, <laughs> and they're really grainy. So I don't know if we're going to be able to pull stuff up. For, for it, but I will see if there have been any ground-based observations. So, Andrew, in your all-sky view here, is that the is that the moon? Yes, it is very bright, but it's like a thin little sliver of a moon. Yeah, I think it's the the all-sky camera in order to capture the the stars must be set at something like five seconds, so uh, completely blows out the the moon in this picture. But at least we get a nice view of the, the plow and the summer triangle. Yeah, I can totally see the summer triangle there in the bottom left. I can see the uh, um, the Big Dipper there. That's so cool. Oh, here's Mars. Yep, just got it lined up. I started watching it a few hours ago. I can tell it's already rotated. Oh really? Yeah. So Mars, is that the uh, the ice cap over on the right hand, like on the sides of it? I think on my right, your left, yes. And there's another white spot. I think that's the Hellas Basin that's been uh, been having a lot of uh, cloud cover lately. And I can see the the Sartreus Major, that dark region on the limb, that large triangular region starting to rotate forward. I couldn't see that a few hours ago. So it definitely is kind of rotating forward now. Mar Mars has got a rotation. Very similar to the Earth, it's only like 30 odd minutes longer than Earth's rotation. So if you watch it at the same time every night, you see almost the same face of Mars. It changes by about like 15 degrees per night. So it changes very slowly if you watch it every night. They're almost in synchrony, you could say, Earth and Mars in rotation. NGC. No. This is really tough, Helen. We need your help. 
<coughs> help us find this. Yeah, I can't find it. Well, the two, the you see the two images I have found here were either taken from Hubble or the five meter telescope at Palomar, um, and again are pretty pretty low resolution. So I don't know if we'll be able to pull anything without someone spending days and days of observation to pull it out. Yeah. Um, I will try to find a closer designation for it to besides it being what in, in Cepheus. I heard you guys talking. I'd never heard of that guitar nebula before. I never oh, heard that um, I just saw it, it. It's about um, it all, it's about an arc minute in the sky, so there's no way any of us are going to see it. It's mm. way too small. It's like a fifth the size of the ring nebula. I mean, oh. it's, it's itty bitty, eensy weensy. Sorry, Alan, I can't turn. do it. Yeah, it'll it'll look, even if we could see it, it would just look like a dot. <laughs> there are a lot of really challenging planetary nebulae like that that look almost like nothing really. Sorry to smash your guitar nebula <laughs> like rock stars over here, but it's just... well, you know, if someone could give us like a RA declination, we could you know take a crack at it, but. And I moved to. I'm going to move back to Stuart's view. So, Stuart, what, what's going on now? So, um, these are some uh, master lights that were not calibrated all that well, and you can see. Um, let's see. Let me pull up my image manager. So, this is the. This is green. So, this is blue, green, luminance in red, and you can see how. Um, at least on the green, there's some gradient there, and you see a little dust bunny dust bunny there and there's some gradient over here and that'll have to come out a little later in in processing and I'll deal with it. But I sort of jumped ahead um, with this because the whole calibration thing is boring and it takes a long time. So did you so, take like three different photographs of this? Yeah, so what this was is um, this luminance, this one here, this is actually with the supernova. So you can see the supernova right there. This is an old image. Um, this is about uh, two hours of data, um, each 10 minutes each, all stacked together and calibrated with the dark and the, um, the flat frames that I was showing you earlier. Um, this is blue, this is green, this is red, and they uh, it doesn't look blue, green, and red yet because I have not assigned the colors to them yet. So they're all monochrome images. Um, but I have to tell the computer that this is a red image, this is a green image, and this is a blue image. And once I do that, it'll create a color image. And um, I can do that now. Uh, take this out, create, and it's going to create a color image in a second. So um, it looks odd, and that's okay. Desaturate the background, and boom, we have a color image. Um, just like this, and it still it still needs work, but we can see color in the image uh, itself. And so I'll be working. I'm going to be taking this and importing it to Photoshop, and that'll be my next step. Awesome. Okay. Well, I'll I'll watch your screen for when you've mm -hmm. got the next point. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. I'm going back to Andrew's view. What's that, Andrew? That's uh, Comet Panstars. I think C2012. K1. Right on. Nice. Uh, we That's... should probably tell people how to get a hold of us, by the way. We have not tell... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Station yeah. identification. Who are we and how can you get in touch? It's how, how did Helen tell us that she wanted us to try and find that object? She <laughs> used the Q&A app, which is, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube somewhere, there's a little... Uh, link on it that says that I'm interacting with the crowd, and if you click that, you'll see the Q&A app, and you can post your questions there, and we will see them, and we will answer them. Or tell you that we can't find that object. But we love to take requests. Um, so you use the Q&A app. There, you can also comment on YouTube. I'm looking at that. Mm -hmm. uh, you can tweet at us as well. So uh, at the underscore VSP. Or you know you can send smoke signals. I mean, uh, <laughs> call. Facebook. I'm yeah. not checking Facebook. I'm not gonna answer my phone though. So um, I might really? if it's if it's important enough. I'm like <laughs> oh, I have phases of the moon app. Oh, how are you? Phases of the moon app is doing pretty good. It's going. Hey everybody, I'm a phase of the moon. That is truly the phase of the moon right now. 
Mm-hmm. I get so many people emailing me and saying that we're getting the fa- the phase wrong, the uh, the sign wrong. So they they go to their birthday and then they look mm-hmm. at the bottom and they say, "But I'm, you know, my birthday isn't I'm not a cancer in, you know, <laughs> July." Like, I'm like no, it's moon. it's where the moon is, not where the sun is. All right. All right, let's go back to uh, let's go. Gary's got something going on here. Yeah, uh, I got clouds moving in. That is M5 through clouds. It sure is. So I'm trying to find some, and the blinking will be gone by next week. <laughs> right after your um, operating system has been completely uh, revised. Yes, I, I think that's what's going on. Anyway, that's M5 through clouds, and I have uh, clouds circling me right now. Those high, wispy stuff that's getting thicker. So. I'm going to shoot what I can. That's All right. Man, your, your Mars is really great tonight, David. Yeah, it's almost right overhead here, so this look is the best place to look at it. Yeah. Like a beast. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally see the darker regions. The, oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, nor- the northern pole cap is turned forward for this opposition right now, so that's the, the white spot you're seeing on one of the limbs. The oppositions are getting slowly better. In, in 2018, we're going to have an opposition nearly as good as the, the one in 2003. It's going to be like within an arc second. So they're, they're, we're in a cycle of where the oppositions are getting better. So, Hannah, what's your favorite object to share with the, uh, the children? Um, I usually show the moon because it's from Bombay. Uh, but Jupiter, yes. We show yeah. Jupiter a lot of times. That's, that's nice. They get so thrilled because you can see the bands on Jupiter. And uh, you can see the moons of Jupiter, so they get really thrilled. And have I guess a lot of them have never had a chance to even look through a telescope. I mean, most no, people no. have no. never had a chance to look through a telescope. Uh, the pollution is so bad that I mean, I don't know how many kids these days even look up at the stars. They make up constellations and stuff. So uh, they are thrilled. Even the moon, uh, when they see the craters, and you know, when they know that, that those craters are so many years, billions of years old, so they get really excited. How how bad is the uh, is the light pollution there? It must just be like um, Los Angeles bad. But uh, so I I stay close to the uh, sea, so that side, the western side, the western you know, part of the sky is still not so bad. Um, but uh, yeah, it's I mean five months in Bombay we have the uh, rainy season, so it's like completely clouded out. And yeah, the rest of the time, yeah, it is light pollution is a big problem, but. The major, the like Orion and all, we can make out. Yeah, Shaw's got the got the the uh, the cloud pollution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the rainy season, which I also have. Yeah. Well, you're you. It's just because you live in Vancouver. It's always cloud season for you. No way. We're almost we're almost out of it. It's it's starting to turn into full blown paradise now. So, um, I'm gonna go back to see what Stuart's up to now. He's like something's got levels. Something's got levels right. going on. So right now what I'm doing is I'm stretching out the color. And so as I, I'm just, uh, uh, and this is, I normally don't do it this way. And I screwed something up. So I got to stuff. Yeah, see, it's, see, look how crappy that is. So I, I did something wrong. So I'm going to, I'm going to undo all this. And see, this is what we deal with. So I, I kind of want to show... You're moving too fast for me to see how bad it is. Yeah, so, it was pretty bad, so okay. I'm going to start over here. It hasn't quite resolved. No. So, what, so what are you doing, though? So right now, if, you, if we look at this histogram here, see how um, all the data is all the way on this left-hand side. Okay, so you see all this, this spike of black is all the way over to the left. Mm-hmm. And so what I need to do is I need to stretch that data out such that um, we actually see something. Um, and to do that, you need to, there's two ways to do it. There's called linear and nonlinear stretches. And this, a linear stretch would be to do something like this and just move the white slider over. None of us ever do that. Um, you can see how, how terrible it looks. Uh, but a, a nonlinear stretch would be to do what I was doing with curves and to selectively stretch parts of, um, parts of the image to um, bring out the data that you want to bring out. And so sense. why do you have to do it? You're doing it like a bunch of steps. Why do you have to do a bunch right. of steps? Because if you do it um, all in one, then you get what's called um, 
I think it's called posterization. I forget the term for it. But um, what ends up happening is um, everything you get, you clip all the middle areas, and then it looks terrible. It just it looks much better if you do it just in little steps. Right. So you right, take so baby let's, steps. Let's see, let's see you do it now. Bring the light in a way that doesn't look uh, posterized. Right. I love how you're just teasing it and just pulling out right. that galaxy, or both galaxies. It's like you're a doctor, and you're able to yeah. just pull this out. you got magic hands. Right. So here I'm lowering the black point just to kind of stretch it out. We can start seeing it coming here, see? That's really cool. And so this is just the color data. There. So, you know, that's not bad for a real quick quick little process. Just using, he's using a combination of levels and curves. And so that's the this is the color. And then I'm going to do the same thing to the luminance and then and then blend them together. So here's the luminance image and I'm just going to do the do this the is same so thing. good. We just might have to use some of your photography for VSP promotions. <laughs> you already are. I know. <laughs> That's really so, cool. So what I'm referencing there is if you go to the Virtual Star Party's Google Plus page, our header at the very top shows what? Is that the double cluster? Double cluster, yeah. Double and normally I don't go this fast, but obviously we're you know we're under time pressure here, but. So this is the luminance version, and then you're going to... This gonna, is the luminance gonna... version I'm doing right now. Right. So, and then, so now what I'm going to do is watch this. So I'm going to get the luminance version, copy the luminance version, cop paste it on top of the color version, and they're doing what's called a luminance blend. And there we go. Nice. And so, you know, and the, you, there's, there's a lot more stuff that you can do to this. Um, you know, there's still a gradient there, and you, know, you can bring out more detail and stuff like that. But that's that's basically more or less how, you know, how we all kind of process images. And you know, and and you know, obviously it's a lot longer than this, but mm -hmm. um, uh, it's it's not that hard to do. So I, I noticed right now you're using Photoshop, though. Yeah. Um, is is it possible for using open source software like GIMP? Do you, have, yeah. do, you do similar processes? Yes, there are, there are people who do use GIMP. Um, uh, not a lot of people who use GIMP. I think Gary has used GIMP. Um, I played with it some time ago, but I yeah. Don't use it now. And um, most most of us are sort of moving over to um, a program called PixInsight, which is cheaper than Photoshop and is really specific for astrophotography, but I'm not good enough yet to show it. Have you got some clouds there, David? Oh, maybe not. A little bit. There's a, there's a little bit. There's probably some dew collecting on the front, too. Time to pull I, I, that hair dryer. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I got the dew shield on, too. It's, uh, I zoomed in on it, so it's also going to magnify all the turbulence, too. Yeah. No, it's great. Yeah. It's a great big oh. Mars. I'll probably move over to Saturn here in about 10 minutes or so. Yeah, I hope everyone appreciates that we're seeing a view of Mars better than we've seen in years and years and years. How, how about, about six years. About the, six years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, we, we had opposition since then, but like I said, they come around every two years, but not all oppositions are favorable, and we're actually in a cycle of bad oppositions right now. So where Mars happens to be near its furthest point while while it's reaching opposition. Mars has quite an elliptical orbit, so it can vary considerably when we're at its closest point. Yeah, and so the one in two years from now is going to be even better. Even better in 2016, and then 2018 is going to be another good one. Like I said, almost as good as 2003. Pretty much Will it as look as big as the moon? <laughs> <laughs> I think I heard it's going to be bigger this time. Bigger right? than the moon? Yeah. It was on the internet. It's got to be true. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, Somebody, that's someone an, emailed that's it August. to me. That's is that in August? That's only in yeah. August, yeah. That's the August moon that's yeah, Mars is bigger than the moon. Start getting those emails. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've been battling it, uh, you know, for... But it amazing. keeps you in business, man. I, I mean, know, it, it truly really does. does. Yeah, yeah. We, we, all, we all recycle the same posts over and over again every yeah. year. So. I mean, if there's anything as an evergreen article for yeah. journalism, <laughs> No, it. Mars will not be bigger than the moon. Uh, Andrew, what do we got? 
Yeah, this is uh, actually not a live image. This is a couple of nights ago, as you can see from the timestamp. Uh, what we have here is the Whirlpool galaxy taken with the Malincam uh, a couple of nights ago. Oh, nice. The, 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 uh, comet you just, the comet you just showed, K1 Panstars, was very near that a few nights ago. That's right. I've seen some uh, lovely wide field images that have yeah. uh, both of them in the picture. Uh, really good opportunity. Yeah, terrific. And Gary, I think you've got some clouds. I'm getting clouded out. That is M53, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to pull some old ones and show them here. Sure. And, you know, we were talking about uh, Stuart was talking about the processing, and we tend to jump over things without explaining it because we know. But you say red, green, and blue. Some people might understand that the uh, human eye sees in red, green, and blue, and it's a mixture of those. So anytime you want to make a color picture, all you need is a red, a green, and a blue. Mix them, and you can get all the other colors, because that's the way the human eye works. Got a question here from Matthew Woods. Uh, does the sun move through the galaxy arms as it orbits around the galactic center? And uh, I actually did a video on YouTube just about a month back about that. So um, the galactic the sun takes about 240 million years to complete an orbit around the around sort of the center of the Milky Way. Um, and but actually, it passes through one of the spiral arms about every 10 million years. And the spiral arms are actually density waves. So they don't, they're not actually like a, a thing that exists in the galaxy. They're actually, stars are moving in and out of these density waves as, the, uh, as they move around the galaxy. So, um, so yeah, the sun does move through the, uh, through the arms and back out again. And uh, right now we're what? We're in the Orion Spur of the, yeah. which, which arm are we in? Sagittarius arm? No. No, not in Sagittarius arm. Uh, it's the Norma arm, I think. The Orion Spur and the Norma arm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah. so, we, but you know, but every ten million years or so, we go through another arm, and yeah. we're surrounded by star formation. And so it's like we're doing back out again. the galactic wave. Yeah, wave. Yeah. But yeah, so if you do a search on YouTube for um, why do galaxies have arms, you'll see the the uh, video that I did. And a demonstration with a bunch of cars piling up on a highway. So if you're watching this on YouTube right now, subscribe to this channel and just yeah. look through this channel. Yeah, look through this channel and you'll see the uh, the video I did. Um, Alright. Well, I'm going to move to... Uh... So Stuart, have you got an update now or are you just continuing Yeah, so to... what I did here um, is... Oops. Is I applied... Um, uh, an unsharp mass to it, which will kind of sharpen uh, the, e the the edges between the uh, low and high contrast areas, and also I put it through a noise filter, so it's a little less um, uh, a little less noisy. And um, and I balanced out the gradient using a plugin called Gradient Exterminator. That um, you remember before on the upper left there was sort of yellowish, and on the lower right it wasn't. And that filter got rid of that, and so now it's it's a nice um, uh, even neutral sky color all the, oops, all the way across the across the sky. That was great. So what's the total um, the total imaging time on this? This was uh, three, four, f about six hours, I believe. Right. Um, I, if I remember correctly, I'd have to look back through my notes, but it, it, knowing me, it was uh, three hours of luminance data and then three hours of color data. Um, more or less, you know, and I probably threw out some bad subs, but in that in that range. So this is about six hours of data, and um, uh, I was uh, trying to catch that um, uh, supernova. Yeah, and and you can you can see it. You yeah, know, totally right, see it right there. So it's awesome. And now I know how to see it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Andrew, what do you got there? Yeah, this is the wonderful uh, Sombrero Galaxy, um, one of my favorites. I've seen a really good amateur image of this uh, quite recently. I think off, uh, again, off the Eye Telescope Network, I think it was. Um, it's, uh, this is absolutely one of my favorite galaxies. I would say this and M51, which was the other one you showed, are my two pretty much favorite galaxies. Of course, the Milky Way is all right, but, uh, yeah, but this one, just that. Cool. Yeah. Oh, here, and Scott's got a view of it, too. 
And actually, I'm, I'm going to say that Andrews is better. I'm using Stellarium right now yeah. just, uh, to pull up. <laughs> is, this, no. is this one live, Andrew? No. It is, yeah. It's, it is live. Uh, okay. It was a five-minute uh, uh, image. So I had to wait a, a bit of a while, which is why I was uh, showing an old image of M51. It was like uh, watching the kettle boil, just waiting. For which it to come which in. telescope are you using, Andrew? This is uh, a telescope known as T3 on the Eye Telescope Network. So this is from New Mexico. Right. No, no. But which? Um, what? What are the what, specs? Of the ah, sorry. Right. Let me what just. Twenty-inch uh, plane, plane waves. Get them uh, up. Yeah. So it is. A Takahashi 150. Oh, oh. <laughs> nice. And it's got a, an S big uh, one shot color CCD on it. Huh. Yeah, I mean, the Takahashis are like the Ferraris of telescopes. Hey, mine's okay. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you could replace your telescope with a Takahashi, would you do it? Well, I don't know. It's, it's actually Straight more up. or less the same. No, well, yeah. Really? I like my scope. Same, same. Right, you know, I said, I'll just swap out that. No, my, the, the te you, you can't, it, the tech, it's, Tech scopes are, are second to none. I'm sorry. I'm a, I'm a tech fan. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, This is the good thing about yeah. uh, being able to use the eye telescope network. Yeah. You can have a Takahashi one day and a plane wave 17 inch the next yeah. day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, and just, all I, from the comfort of your, you know, of your kitchen table with some nice hot tea. So. That's right. Lovely. So, Andrew, are you processing that at all? Um, no, no, that's straight off the that's the raw image straight off the camera. Really, I'm I'm so glad that they've they've added these color cameras to these to these telescopes. Yeah, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to get back in touch with Peter again <laughs> and see if we can get more of these images coming up for for <laughs> random stuff for the VSP. Yeah, I know, I know. Frustrated to have one of these on standby. We're like, oh well, you know, while we're waiting, let's let's switch to the plane wave. Oh, everyone cut it out. All right, I guess I'll drive it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gary, so this is an image from the past. This is from January, uh, and this is the propeller nebula. That is so cool. One of these images that you showed us early on, and we've been finding every year. Yeah, yeah. One of, I just did in uh, hydrogen alpha beginning. Now it's kind of kind of color. That's terrific. And so, David, are you uh, you going after Saturn now? Is that the plan? You're working in the darkness now. Hey, whoa! He was high resolution yeah. for a second there. Yeah, I know. Every time I switch cameras, it goes high res, then it goes back. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 attempting to line up Saturn right now. Um, oh, here we go. Another picture from Gary. Oh, oh. look at that. And this is the, another one from January six, the Rosette. I just can't. I can't do my processed image. That's not fair. I'm just going to show ones we've done in a VSP. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Stu's processing images. I don't see why you Shaw, what have you got, speaking of things that are processed? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, uh, this was the Eta Carina Nebula in the southern sky. This was taken um, when I was in Australia in, 2000, in March 2013, last year, yeah. Was that hard to take your telescope to Australia? Uh, I, I brought this small uh, 65 um, mm uh, aperture scope. This is just a small scope and a... IOPTRON Smart EQ mount, so it's pretty much a small setup. Uh, I don't want to drag the whole the big ones to the to the flight. It's a nightmare. Yeah. So yeah, but this is actually using the Canon 5D Mark II, the unmoded version. Oh wow. So, yeah, so it gets a lot of lot of image, a lot, lot of wow. nebulous from. So image. what is what is one of these telescopes run? I I I could I've got a 5D Mark II. This this was uh, using the the scopes with a focal length of about 420 mm, so it's a short focal length scope. Uh, so it's pretty much an easy target actually. It's real bright, and um, you can see. I mean, look at look at the stars over there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a miracle. All you had to do was get yourself to the southern hemisphere, down to Australia. And... Yeah, yeah. They have all the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, but Corn. then we have Saturn. Yeah, Corey. Uh, Sort of sends me a new image every couple of days from from South Africa. Like, feast your eyes on this. So, yeah, I get those too from him. I think he, I does a lot. he just likes toying with us. Like, yeah. hey guys, you know, I, I kind of miss 
being in Iowa, but not really. See, look at this. Look at this. Amazing. And then these gigantic spiders that come into his house. Yeah. Well. <laughs> another another uh, image from the past, Andrew. Yes, yeah, afraid so. I'm just waiting for another five-minute live image. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, while we wait for that one, this one is M13 from uh, the Malin Cap. Shorter image again. Yeah. Try do try doing like two-minute images. Yes, I will. I I was yeah. I meant to do that, um, but uh, you know, well, as, as you go yeah, just, back and click the acquire image button, you suddenly go, oh no, I didn't change the time. <laughs> right. Well, if you if you bin it, you know, just bin it two by two, um, you'll be able to. You know, you won't. You know, we don't care about the the resolution so much. Oh, we do. No, I mean, <laughs> I mean it'll increase the sensitivity by four. Yeah, the, so. Remember, the resolution is like six forty by four eighty. I mean, right. the resolution so, is right. Is and so, you know, low. so so if you just bin it two by two, then you know you'll be able to get shorter images. Yeah, I, I forget what it's on. I think it might be on two by two already, but uh, I'll check yeah. that out. Stuart. Thanks. Yeah. So you've got some clouds in front of Saturn, David? A little bit, mostly turbulence. Like I said, it's it's very. There's a lot of moisture around. It's clear, but it's the it's typically Florida damp. So it's it's right over the house too. So I'm sure there's mm. probably some heat giving off. Right, and it's lower. Like Mars is really high up, and and Saturn's a little lower now. Yeah, Saturn's yeah. in uh, Libra right now. It's the brightest thing in Libra, as a matter of fact. But it's high to the southeast here right now, just over the peak of the house. I could just tell by looking at my. Uh... My horoscope that Saturn was in. <laughs> is, that, is that a tropical or sidereal? <laughs> Stop. I'll slap you both. <laughs> That's terrific. I am right, Gary's see. picture here. Uh, another one from January, the horse head and the... That was, uh, a, good, the that was a good night. Yeah, it was. That was. In a satellite. In a satellite. <laughs> Look at that. I think the satellite's more of just underlining, like, look how awesome this is. So it's, I think he planned it that way. I've moved to Shaw's uh, next image from his uh, Australia trip. Yes, the blast from the past. <laughs> this is the, uh, the Omega Centauri, the big globular oh, cool. cluster in Centaurus. It's really big and it's bright and it's humongous. Um, you this you can't see that from the Northern Hemisphere, too. Yeah, 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 it's pretty, yeah, from, from Malaysia it's about um, 40 degrees on the south, never yeah. gets higher and, and, and any more than that, but from, from Australia it's like overhead. I remember the first time I went over there in 2009, I spent one hour trying to recognize Scorpio and only to realize it's upside down. <laughs> <laughs> they don't tell them that. They, they <laughs> Shoot. That's <laughs> great. That, that is a weird thing about, yeah, I've been down the Southern Hemisphere about five times, and yeah, it's weird to see familiar constellations upside down. So, so sorry, so what's the telescope using? 65 millimeter shot? What, what model is it? Is the uh, TS, TS scope? Uh, I'm not really sure what was the T and the S stands for. Um, totally just, spectacular. Just, is it the <laughs> TS quadrupet <laughs> astrograph? Yes, yes, that's the one. Yes, okay. it's the one, the 65mm f6.5, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken. That's a, that's a pretty fancy 65mm telescope. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I enjoy it more uh, compared to the one that I'm using, the Skywatcher 120mm at home, because maybe because of the wider field of view and uh, much easier to set up in the, in the site. Yeah. And then what do you use for a mount? Uh, is the iOptron Smart EQ. Smart EQ mount? Yeah. It's a very small, I mean, I think it's the most portable, usable equatorial mount uh, for small scopes uh, so far that I've been using now. Which is great. Yeah, this is a great little telescope. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued. It's a great combo for, for, for outings, traveling on using, using airplanes or things like that. It's very small. Yeah. Yeah. Another one of Gary's views from the past. Yep, the Orion from the same uh, January VSP. Uh, Lillian Brennan's asking, on that January image of the horse head, what was the bright white and purple object to the left side of the image? Um, that's the Alnitak, uh, the left-hand star in Orion's belt. 
and the purple and all that is just artifacting because it is so much brighter than everything else in the picture. It just blows out the camera. Um, Hello. Eric, <laughs> Eric Roberts is asking, can you suggest some good sky targets besides the planet that would be visible from light polluted burbs? The moon? Yeah, the moon's yeah. good. <laughs> usually I do star parties from downtown. Usually it's planets, the moon, and double stars. Bright double yeah. stars. Yeah. You know, the summer um, triangle's good. Yeah. Some brighter star clusters, like the double cluster, or... The, um, Sometimes you can get to the Orion Nebula. Brighter Nebula, nebula the... Globular cluster in uh, Hercules. Omega Centauri, if it were overhead. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So first, you need to go down south. Yeah. First thing you do is leave your dark. <laughs> no. So I mean, if you, if you live in light polluted skies, you can do what Gary's done, which is that he shoots with a hydrogen alpha filter, and that. So lets you him build see. your own observatory, and you just have a little base of operations. Yeah. And and you know, sink a little bit of money into it. Or you well, can you can keep it easy way that I filter. do is I just take my binoculars and go out to uh, just go out about an hour and a half away to get away from the city. Yeah, yeah. We always recommend start with a pair, nice pair of binoculars. Yeah, yeah. Those uh, you got like what the twenty five by one hundreds, twenty five by eighties from um, the 20, Celestron ones, right? The yeah, big... twenty five by seventy five, something like that. Yeah, those are those are great. You know, you can see the moons of Jupiter, the rings of Saturn, clusters, yeah. all kinds of good dark I've sky. I've been types. able to film the Pleiades. I mean, it's just... It's oh, great. yeah. I, I love it. All right, so, Shaw, what do we got now? Uh, this is the, the Southern Pleiades. Uh, Southern I believe it's, Pleiades. Yeah, the Southern Pleiades, yeah. It looks pretty much like the Pleiades, but uh, with the difference, with the stars, with the star field behind. I Seven think more sisters? Uh, what? Seven more sisters. <laughs> um, have we got uh, any kind of tarantula nebula action going on? Um, Did you get anything of the uh, larger, small Magellanic clouds? I got a wider field of view over here. Uh, hold on, eh? All right. Yes. Well, you know, we don't need to go to the southern hemisphere now. You've captured the whole thing. <laughs> That's but, it. But you forget we have people like Paul and Teal and Peter that, I mean, Paul is just steps in, just blows everyone away and drops his mic and leaves. Yeah. But... <laughs> well, I don't know if people saw, so we did during the, uh, the CosmoQuest hangout thon last week, we did the I virtual star that. party. And uh, and Paul just came in and was like, hey, check out these prominences on the sun. I'm like, that's great, but could you make it a time lapse? And he's like, yep. And then he's oh. got a time lapse of prominences blasting off the surface of the sun. Yeah, he's a monster. So, Andrew, what do we got? Okay, this was the next one coming in. This is the Sunflower Galaxy. Really is galaxy season at the moment. So yeah. this is M63. Super. I might try and make that a little bit bigger, but I'm not there's sure. There's more galaxies would look. in there. Is there something in sort of the upper right there? <laughs> I mean, when you start getting into the Virgo, it's just galaxies everywhere. Yeah, not sure. Hmm. <laughs> so great. All right. I'm going to go to Gary's view. Uh, again, January. This was the 19th, and it's the Bubble Nebula. Awesome. That was a good night. <laughs> You're on fire. Memories. Memories. Kind of looks like the, the yin and yang symbol. All right, and there's Shaw's view of the uh, large and small magic <laughs> of the cloud. Yeah. There's the the small and a and a the small one is on the on the sec on the right I think, and the large one on the towards the middle. Hmm. So it's very very easy to look with the naked eye. I was surprised to see it very very easily. How how dark were your skies where you were? Was it like just super dark? Yeah, it's super dark. I mean, I've been talking to to the guy in front of me and I couldn't even see his face. So I'm not sure who I'm talking to at, at that time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was really dark. Yeah. Bill Kovacs is reminding everyone that the Eta Aquarids meteor shower is this week. This is the Halley Comet meteor shower, right? Yeah, they, they peak tonight, yeah. They, they peak over the next few nights, but yeah. It's, uh, I think they give off about a zenithal hourly rate of about 40 per hour, so it's, a, it's not a bad shower. I may stay out a little bit longer and watch for them tonight. 
Okay, Stuart's got a picture. He's a, a live picture he's taking right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and that is just like yeah. one ten second exposure. Yeah, one ten second exposure. exposure. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Th this is a. Uh, um, this is actually was one of the first pictures I took. Wow. Um, I was just sort of digging through my my old files and. Um, uh, these were. This was a series of 90-second exposures all stacked together um, from about four or five years ago now. That um, I got some help in processing from my friends uh, Mike Chase and Chris Ford. Um, um, but I'm just sort of dating back through through old images because um, uh, because they just happen to be here. Uh, Scott Chapman says the image de uh, processing demo was fascinating and something that, as a beginner, I certainly need to learn more about. Any chance of an online show dedicated to going all the way from image capture through processing to final image? Didn't we do that? We've done similar things to that, but um, I, I think we can redo it as long as we keep uh, certain guests like Stuart from just rambling on and on and on. I love you, Stu, but you do ramble, so I will have to be a uh, thing. <laughs> I, will to, I will have to be more structured. Because what turned into like a three-part series just kept going on. So I think we can redo it, and if I crack the whip, because you know how hardcore I am about that, but I will be a little bit better and keep us on task. I would, I would totally love a show like that where you talk about astrophotography, but I have no clue how to process images. See, so actually, Hannah, you, you and I should do it, and you can crack the whip. You can be the, the bad cop. Oh. <laughs> You're doing a good job at that. Yes. <laughs> it's one thing that I have found working with you the last few days is you are really good at getting, like, no, you're doing this. No, yep, you're doing it. And I, I'm just great. good at bugging people. <laughs> I love not having to bug people. So. I'm going to get blocked by a lot of people because of Ninth May. <laughs> All right, uh, great. So now that we've uh, insulted all our astronomers, and, I've not uh, insult. I only insult <laughs> Stu because he insults me. <laughs> oh right, well <laughs> all the time, <laughs> especially when I throw my back out and he asks for pictures. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but uh, didn't what well, didn't tell uh, like Mike, Michael, and Stuart and uh, Chris did one about two years ago? Yeah, but I'm sure the techniques yeah, changed like a year and a half ago, and it kind of. Time to update it, right? Yeah. You mean in terms of image processing? Yeah, just like how to go through. Like, didn't one of you provided the rest of them with? with yeah, images so I asked, and... I think Ahmed Kale to provide some some data for all of us to go through. Yeah, Ahmed provided some data, and then you guys all processed it, and yeah. Um, Maybe I'll I'll have a class. That, well, that I mean, there there are all kinds of of videos that are available you know online and YouTube for free there's that we can recommend you know people who've gone through this with screen sharing their programs and using Comtasa Studio and all that kind of stuff um, uh, Niall Lynn McKee asks how long of an exposure did you take these with also would I have much luck observing Orion with my new 9 inch Dobsonian hey congrats oh. on the new 9 inch Dobsonian uh, um, I'm rocking a low power lens with a low power mm. fossil magnifier. So, uh, well, if you've got a camera connected to your telescope, different objects require different lengths of exposure time. So, the moon, it can be fractions of a second. Same with the planet. The planets, you'll want to record video and then stack them up with the uh, with some of these deep sky objects. You're going to want to do. Um, Longer uh, exposures, and as you saw, uh, Shaw, uh, sorry, um, Stuart had one that he'd done three images and had done uh, an hour, two hours each, just each color. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so it, it all just depends. You're just gonna have to get out there uh, with a Dobsonian. I don't know if you've got it on a on a um, on a tracking mount. That's the problem with the Dobsonians, is they don't tend to have a, a good tracking mount, so they're not the best pick for doing uh, astrophotography. But uh, uh, um, unless you're Corey, which he is, just <laughs> unless you're Corey, like hands of gold your own and... tracking. Well, no, I mean some Dobsonians do come with a you know with a tracking mount, but in many cases they're uh, they're more for keeping the object in the field of view than they are for 
really, really careful, long exposure astrophotography. So this, this show has me feeling really nostalgic. Looking back at all the things, I mean, you know, Corey started off with his Dobsonian in his backyard, whole, you know, hand guiding it, and yeah. now we see his amazing images and just you know, seeing like yeah, well, know, they're astronomy's power couple now. It's. You, you guys are all awesome. We've all grown together and <laughs> changed, gotten better, lost our hair. Uh, <laughs> well, Scott never had it. Scott no, I didn't. Yeah. Did. yeah. Uh, all right. So, Andrew, uh, what are we looking at here? Yeah, it's another. This is the actual video recording from the Malin Cam the other night when I was um, trying to find pan stars. Well, actually, did find pan stars. So I, I don't know whether my last image for my telescope is going to actually make it through in time. So I just play this video. So this is how um, it plays back as you're using the Malin Cam, and suddenly, just like a CCD, you're taking an exposure, and then boom, it sort of comes onto the screen. Uh, once it's ready and uh, I use this quite a bit of outreach uh, so you can put this on a big TV screen uh, so you don't have people queuing up at the eyepiece yeah uh, and they can also have projectors so this is uh, pan stars from a couple of nights ago um, we've got a question here from Brian Hunt uh, do you have te information on radio telescopes and how they work uh, I recommend uh, because we don't have a lot of time that you listen to the episode of Astronomy Cast that we did all about radio telescopes, radio astronomy, and uh, Pamela explains how they work. Or um, get a hold of Nicole. I, and or, or well, I don't know if we want to like have Nicole explain oh, it. I right will now. totally send people over to Nicole. She does it to me. So noisy astronomer on Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> ask her. So so yeah, send Nicole an email. Say please explain how radio telescopes work. Or send her a tweet. She's awesome. Tweet, and if, yeah. and mm -hmm. if she gets angry, tell her that I sent you. Yeah. Get angry so <laughs> but but yeah, no, we we've, we've done an explainer on. I mean, the, the trick with radio telescopes, to give you the short version, is they have pretty much one pixel resolution. So while these telescopes we're using, you know, will have huge resolutions, five thousand pixels. You know, however big the CCD is, a radio telescope has one pixel. And so what they do is they move the radio telescope across the sky and build up this image line by line, dot by dot. Um, but you but it's you can build your own radio telescope in the backyard using an old uh, you know one of those big twelve inch uh, dishes and uh, and or sorry, twelve foot dishes, you know the big the big backyard uh, radio dishes and and do radio amateur radio astronomy mostly looking at the sun and maybe Jupiter but that's right about it. yeah I went last time when I was visiting Nicole and Tim she had a bunch of like direct TV and stuff like in her garage there's gonna set her own array and I'm like yep that's the redneck array right there I was just like oh, <laughs> get us all a bunch of direct TV we're gonna do some radio astronomy. All right, well, why don't we start to wrap this up? I don't know how your time is, uh, Andrew. Time for one last image, but uh, we'll sort of say goodbye to everybody, and then if it comes through, we'll we'll, we'll jump to you. Yeah. So, uh, Dave Dickinson, I, I, I love, I gotta say, I love the cinematography. I love the setup of you with that telescope sort of working in the darkness. It's really cool. I, I have three webcams out here, believe it or yes. not. <laughs> That's my man. You think a lot about the presentation of this. I yeah. yeah. Your uh, presence Gary. is profound. Thanks as always. <laughs> yep. Thank you. And uh, sorry you had some clouds. Um, That's not too bad. So. It's Florida. And thanks for joining us for the first time, Hannah. It's great to have you. And My one pleasure. last reminder: When do people need to all go out to the sidewalks and uh, share their telescope views? So it's on 9th May, uh, but some people are keeping it on 10th May as well. It depends. It's it's very flexible. So whatever suits you all. And uh, people who want to join in, they can send us an email at onesky at knowthecosmos.com. And uh, I mean, we are looking for more people to join us from different countries. So I hope we can just jump in. Yeah, we're at what? We're at 12, 13 countries so far? We are 12 countries. We are trying to, yeah, hopefully, let's, let's hope for Singapore and Indonesia to join us as well. And, and so, yeah, all we're really looking to do is just showing people that there are way too many things built between us that separate us all, but we have this one thing in common, and we can all just get out there and share this experience. And, you know, it takes some you know, take some pictures together just going out and having a good time sharing that. Uh, it, send out tweets or, you know, even just share your thoughts at the moment using the hashtag OneSky, and just more of a, a big humanity experience of, of being able to just go out and, 
and have a good time and try to transcend a lot of the things that keep us apart. That sounds great. And Shaw, you're going to be participating from uh, Cloudy Malaysia? <laughs> no, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I'll be going over to the one of the newest observatory that we have over here in uh, Teluk Kemang in one of the states about one hour drive from Kuala Lumpur. So it's going to be great. There's going to be the, 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 the spot where all the, all the people from uh, all over Malaysia will be coming in, coming in over there. So hopefully it's going to be great over there. That sounds great. Yeah. Stuart, thanks for uh, thanks for doing that quick and dirty tutorial. That was, yeah, uh, that was great. I think people sure. really like that. So, And Andrew, thanks for getting up super early. Where's where's the timer? Are we looking at a timer here? Yeah, it, it's actually finished the exposure. One of the last things it does is, unfortunately, is create the, uh, the preview image. So I was just waiting for that to see if it arrived in time. Um, but I still think we're going to be waiting for another uh, 30 seconds or all so. Right. Well, Ciro Vila says, uh, we all share the same sky, but only myself and Scott share the same bald head. It's true. <laughs> <You're wrong. laughs> yeah, well, there, yeah there little too. fills in there, too. Fills there, there, yeah. I think it's something about astronomy just uh, wipes out your hair follicles. It's true. Or, Watch or, out, you know, use a razor. That's your future. Look at this right here. <laughs> Um, uh, Niall says, uh, oh, thanks for answering. It's an old one, so no tracking mount, but uh, my old man's got a nice 10-inch tracking Celestron, though. So so take your telescope, set it aside, grab your dad's 10-inch telescope, and, and, and then that will be great for doing astrophotography. Yes. Um, what else have we got here? Patrick Calhoun says, can video be done on a Nex5 and a SE8 Celestron telescope? Absolutely. In fact, that's pretty much what Dave Dickinson's running. Yeah, yeah. So, oh, yeah. You don't need anything really fancy. No. Just an 8-inch <laughs> Celestron telescope. Nothing <laughs> fancy, you know. Well, I'm going to share some pictures real quick from the event page as well. This one I'm using is about 20 years old, so. <laughs> Julie Scott, Andrew's got a picture. No. Yeah. <laughs> M64, the Black Eye Galaxy. Oh, look at that. Really does look like someone punched it. Mm. All right, so Scott, why don't you draw off some last images from the... Uh... So this is from Stephen Ron. Uh, this was taken on Saturday night uh, near the Tennessee-North Carolina border, and they're all pointing at the Big Dipper, which I think is awesome. Great <laughs> silhouette shot down here. That's a fantastic picture. I love it. That's cool. I uh, should be able to zoom in. So, yeah, I love, love that, and... see what else we have here. There's a couple more. There's some from the Eclipse as well. Um, here's another one from Stephen Ron. Uh, it's, this is Pan Stars. So we grabbed a look at this earlier, but there's Pan Stars for you. Zoom and enhance. Uh, Dave, is this a binocular object? Just barely. It's eighth magnitude. I, I couldn't see it with binoculars tonight. I could see it with the telescope, though. And there's another one, Comet Jacques, that's in... Uh, in uh, Monoceros right now. That's 8th magnitude as well. It's it's right on the border being binocular. And let's see here. This is from um, last week's partial clip. This is from Osiris Ra. Oh, oh yeah. love yeah, it. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, that's awesome. This is taken with uh, the same camera that, that I have, and I know that Fraser does too, the T3i. Yep. And wow. Yeah, it's Fantastic. last week. Partial yep. solar, yep. That's just, that's just amazing. So if any of you guys watching want to see these images themselves, they're over on Google Plus at the Virtual Star Party event page. Uh, make sure to give us a circle. And if you have your own astrophotography, please uh, submit them into the event page. Uh, and then we're doing the same thing there with the One Sky event as well. So if you're taking any images of what you're doing there, you can submit them into the event page and just being a part of the event, just like we are now with Virtual Star Party. And one other thing I can recommend, too, which is that if you're on Flickr, um, you can, we've got a big pool of images for Universe Today that we often will share out to, uh, onto Universe Today, and I'm tweeting them all the time. So uh, you can, if you go to Universe Today and then it says Photos at the top, if you click that, that'll take you to the Universe Today photo pool, and you could share your photos into Flickr there as well, and, we, and we'll do that. So if you use 
Google Plus, then share them onto our event pages. If you use Flickr, you can get them um, into the photo pool there, and we'll, you know, it's great. And we'll reshare your oh, images and try and help spread the a word. A lot of those, a lot of those that go in that Flickr pool end up in articles too, because I'm looking I know. at that. I'm I looking know. at that every day. Yeah, there's so uh, we're about what fourteen thousand pictures in there right now. Yeah, there's quite a few. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. So, all right, cool. Well, hey, thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks to all the astronomers. This was fantastic. And uh, and Andrew, thanks for bringing the uh, thanks for bringing the eye telescope. That was a that was a real treat. So, uh, and you did great, Hannah. Uh, we need to hear more from you. Uh, yes. Stop yeah. being so loud. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Interrupting yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> all right. We'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.